Good morning to everybody. I have about uh, 40 minutes to share a couple of techniques which I hope will be useful to you. And I want to go right back to what Kevin just said, the difference that you can make. Because what we're really talking about is the power of person-to-person -person communication and verbal communication. Um, a quick addition to what she said, to, what Katie said to introduce me, because it bears directly on what we're doing here. Uh, I was working as the media director for President Reagan, the world's dream job. Particularly when you think media is actually not part of the press office, it's separate, it has everything else, and it doesn't report to the press office. It reported right to the chief of staff, Jim Baker, the world's greatest chief of staff any White House has ever had. <clears throat> and then I got married. Um, and I married, uh, some of I think you know my late husband, Tex Lazar, who was instrumental with Dr. Leidiger in starting TPPF. And he delivered this marry me and moved to Texas line. And the question is, what was I going to do with myself? I like to make this sound very strategic, um, but the real truth is I just got lucky. First day in business, we sat down with Southwestern Bell Telephone. They were one of the first companies that encouraged their own employees to go talk to customers. CEO turns to me and he says, you know what we've learned? The customer does not remember what we thought we told him. I thought, how have I missed this? But I realized that my whole attitude had been, what did I want to say? What did I think somebody needed to know? And of course, the minute you ask, how much do people remember from what you say, a lot or a little, what's the answer? This is not a lecture, guys. We're doing this together. Come on, how much do people remember, a lot or a little? Marginally better. OK, <laughs> let's see if we can warm up a little bit. I wondered if anybody had studied that. So what I want to do this morning in my very brief time, and I am watching Clint the, the, the watch, is show you what we think is one of the main principles of communication. Teach you two techniques, the concept of acknowledging a question, and then I think a very important enlistment technique, which I think people can use on a person-to-person -person basis that can be helpful, and a quick tap of the, of the hat to the role of storytelling. So the first thing we want to take a look at is this key role of words and how they define a brand. And I'll, we'll probably look at a couple of FedEx examples. We work for them since 1991. And this methodology, which we're giving you just a taste of today, is built into their DNA around the world. <clears throat> when the rate hikes take effect February 15th, here's what it will cost to send letters or packages <clears throat> priority overnight, a letter. OK, so you can see we're raising rates. Who's the audience? Come on, guys, this is interactive. Customers, how do they feel about rate hikes? They don't like them. OK. FedEx has to own a word. It is the anchor of their brand, whether you're talking about ground or express or the suites of consulting services like customs and uh, logistics. People use FedEx products and services and frequently pay more for them because they feel that FedEx's delivery of those products and services over time is more, in one word, reliable. reliable. Bingo. I love this part of this. 50 cents more, a 10-pound <clears throat> box, $2.25 more, and a 50-pound box, $4.25 more. Do you think that this is going to hurt you vis-a-vis -vis some of your other competitors like Airborne and DHL? Okay. One of the interesting things that's happened over probably the last 80 years is that we have socialized people to think that good questions are negatively framed. And we see this in every venue. Reporters, analysts, I know Congressman Burgess is coming here. He will back up what I'm saying in town hall meetings. Okay. So the question is not hostile, but it's how could this hurt you? This is the top of the encounter, the most important part. There's our guy at the top of the screen. He needs to instantly introduce the concept of greater reliability. Customers may make some trade-offs for lesser reliability. And he does. All right. So the first thing we're looking at when we think about how to make this model work is what are the words that we want to own? And we divide the world into Three kinds of words. Good words, they're the ones you want repeated and propagated. Bad words, the words you don't want repeated and propagated. And jargon words. And part of our problem are jargon words. Okay, so let's take a look at the most obvious ones, which are the negative words, which are the ones you see first, and also how they bounce back and forth. This is the reporter who moved next to vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin to write a book about her. There are people on the other side of, side of the coin who, and Joe, they say this is a little creepy. Okay, negative word is? Creepy. creepy. How do you respond to that? Well, you know, creepy is as creepy does. 
If I lived here and did something creepy, if I did what Sarah Palin is suggesting that I moved here because I had some desire to do, that would be creepy. And of course, the word he has pounded home is creepy, and in fact, getting creepier all the time, right? Okay, yeah. <clears throat> So we always tell people, re reporters are where you start looking for this, because it's so obvious. Okay. Um, your critics say this reveals that you are a political bully. Okay, negative word is? Bully. Your style is payback. Are you, and does this compromise your ability to serve? No, I'm not. Because I am who I am, but I am not a bully. And of course the quote becomes, I'm not a bully, right? Uh, now, interesting that you mentioned that. Um, you mentioned the word crook. <clears throat> um, so next piece of this is uh, repeating and denying negative words. A big mistake because the listener hears the opposite of what the speaker is saying. So when you deny a negative, the, the negative actually, the denial drops out. We named the genre for the young woman caught with a high profile but unfortunately married man. And she held a press conference and announced I am not a bimbo, that's causing everyone to think she's a bimbo, right? Um, we put out a bimbo memo monthly, the three best bimbos of the month. I really urge all of you here and all of you watching to sign up for it for several reasons. First of all, it's very funny. It's a target-rich environment. But second of all, it's a good teaching tool because we fall into this. I'm fond of headlines. And this is actually my favorite in the montage, because if you look at, at PepsiCo, they are a great marketing company. They'd never take out an ad. That's that formal network of communication in the model before you that says Doritos are not bad for you. And yet there's their CEO, who is a legend, stumbling into the trap, repeating the negative, and notice what happens. It crowds out the positive, and it rises to become the headline. Okay. Um, to the I am not a crook line and the unpleasant person who just contributed that, uh, Tex wrote that speech, my husband. Um, so we would like to replace that line with, I did not have sex with that woman. Okay. <laughs> more updated, more modern. Okay. Um, who's ever doing sound, there's a, this is a tape that may have a problem. So uh, you would think that large companies understand this and frequently, just like PepsiCo, they don't. This is Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors. Okay, negative word is? Crappy cars? And that resonates. Uh, you know, I said, okay, yeah, deal, you're right. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think there were sometimes so many uh, boundaries put on them that we, we didn't give them a recipe for success. All right, give me a concrete example of a crappy car or a crappy innovation in a car, a crappy piece of a... <laughs> okay, so hopefully after just a few minutes I have convinced yourself that the choice of words is critical to defining the brand and that negative words crowd out positive words and they propagate themselves. Okay, now what that means is that you have to be able to tell me what those words are and why. That's job one, to quote Lee Iacocca. Job two is then to get everybody on board. Okay, let's keep going on. This, this is Paul Harrington from Easton Bell Sports. They own sporting good manufacturing uh, companies, including Riddell football helmets. So we're squarely in the midst of what controversy? Concussions, Concussions right? So you would think, oh, this is pretty easy. You buy a helmet because it will keep your player safe. safe. But we can't say that. Why? And the truth is? It is dangerous, right? right? You can't say it will keep your player safe because? It's not true, okay. So, okay, we better need to find another word. So Paul has picked another word. Is there one overarching philosophy you have when running the company? Innovation. Okay. He says, if we think of ourselves as an innovation company, it changes how we recruit people. It changes how we look at our manufacturing process. That changes our relationship with the customer. Now, here's the key thing. He expects every person at every Easton Bell company to be able to tell you those two lines. Absolutely innovation. In our world, uh, in sporting goods equipment, innovation is the key. All right. 
Now, the reason that we need those, this anchor list of good words is because they're the ones you run home to when you're under attack and questioning, which is where all of you and all of us who believe in sensible policy find ourselves. Okay, little drill, coaching hats on. The guy in the black short sleeve t-shirt is the lead scientist for international flavorings, okay? So if you work for international flavorings, what kind of companies or industries are your customers who's buying flavorings? Beverages and? Food, sure, right, bingo, okay. What kinds of words are swirling around in issues food and beverage companies these days? Sugar, high fructose corn syrup, childhood, BC, gluten, what else? Think of additives. Think, well, you're one step ahead of me, okay, okay. Cancer, which is what kind of word? Midnight or bad, right? So we've got all these bad words. Now, what's our side of the story? You're already there. Notice they're in an orange grove. We want people to know our tastes are nice and loud, please. Natural, of course. Okay, this guy could have used your help. You don't want to long linger because you're not going to eat more of it if it lingers. Ah, so I think it's going to be a quick fix, and then have more, and then have more. But that suggests something else. Exactly. Which is called addiction. Exactly. Yep. Are we going in the right direction? I'm trying to create an addictive taste. It's a good word. Now, I do not know what parallel universe this guy lives in, but where I live, and I assume where all of you live, addiction is not a good word. It would be a major bad word, right? Okay. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. People tend to think of communication as a soft skill, but it is actually a foundation. Who's watching this who can cause the food and beverage companies lots and lots of trouble, at least in the US? The government, of course, the FDA. And the FDA was watching. Tens of millions of dollars have been spent, assuming that the other companies are experiencing what we at Dr. Pepper Snapple are, on requests for production of documents, litigation, congressional hearings, all since this guy announced to the world, we're the new nicotine, right? Okay, now, let's make this work in terms of a technique. You're already prepared to do this. The question is a framing question, and we'll take a tip of the hat to framing questions in a second and other types. But the question is, aren't you trying to create an addictive taste? Yes, no. That's a one-word answer. No. no. Where are we going? Our tastes are all natural, of course. In other words, that's basically the concept of communication today. You want to be responsive to every question in a way that puts you back in control of it, but you have to know where you're going or you're stuck like this clown with the concept of addiction. So sad. Now the next thing is to get everybody on board. This is, if I do this right, this is a montage we use at FedEx. The words will just jump out at you. Precision as well as... We're very... This is a classic example of how the combination of online convenience uh, coupled with the speed and reliability of the FedEx shipping network is actually fulfilling customers' expectations. Okay, and the words are? Sp speed reliability, convenience, right? Notice, I mean, he's got, his, he's got those words. Then we're going to jump around the world. Very important that we pro Oh, but the point of this is everybody is on board with those words in every venue. And they're over and over again. Thanks to our customers' requirements to diversify the portfolio. They're looking for more solutions. They're looking for faster solutions, and they're looking for an element of speed, reliability. OK, bingo. Um, FedEx owns the word reliability, and I'm always careful to say that UPS is a great company because they are. They have very different approaches, though, for how they communicate. And one of the reasons FedEx owns that word, and I noticed that you mentioned it, who mentioned it, mentioned it, the, um, the question um, uh, reliability, affordability, those are key words, uh, and they're really important for everybody to be talking about and hammering home. Um, the next thing we're going to take a look at is this concept of a lion. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> pardon me. And I want to introduce the concept of enlistment here. We're going to start with a commercial. This is for a company called Pacific Care. 
Knowledge empowers. So we not only tell you... Certain values never change. We carry them with us wherever we go. At Secure Horizons, we believe these values help us give people with Medicare the kind of health plan they're looking for. Honesty. It's our best policy. Okay. So this is pretty easy. The word they're trying to push through is... Honesty. Okay, this is a slight extender. So when you have questions about our health care coverage, we'll give you straight, honest answers. Okay. What I love about this, and the model in the handout before you takes a look at the formal network of communication, that's everything that a, a company or entity controls, and the informal network. The people who run the formal network of communication always know what they're doing, as in this ad. They got a very clear message, honesty, and straightforward answers. Bingo. Couldn't be clearer. The company is an acquirer. And they bought a health maintenance organization over from Harris Methodist Hospital over in Fort Worth. And there were so many questions from policyholders that the company sent out a letter inviting people to a town hall meeting. And they're going to say, we're going to fly in somebody to answer your questions. Okay, this is the video from the town hall meeting. So it's the same company whose advertisement you just saw, which promised us honesty. And the ad was running at the same time of this meeting. So here's the video from the town hall meeting. Yes, ma'am, the lady in the back. I have been on cell breaks for several months, and Harris has been out yes. there saying $10. Okay, how happy does he look to be there? <laughs> I went in in January to get my prescription removed. I was informed that specific care was no longer paid to sell I was with Harris in January. I have let, let's make that a generic question as opposed to a personalized question because I've heard this question from many people. Why is that transition or change occurring even before February 1st, apparently? Yes. I mean, on January 1st, Harris Methodist, they made this decision for economic reasons in 1999, went from an open formulary to a closed formulary. Okay, all clear? Okay. Does she have any idea what he's talking about? No. If you use a word, phrase, or acronym that your listener does not use on a daily basis, what happens to listening? Stop. It tanks. They miss the next. And can I say this with great affection and admiration for everything that you're all trying to do? You have got too much jargon. Okay. I mean, even things like price negatively, you know, yeah. what's that mean? <laughs> Doesn't mean anything. An open formulary means that. You can have the drugs that are on their formulary <laughs> with no prior authorizations or plan approvals, if you would use the word. Um, on January 1st, they went to a closed formulary. There are drugs on the formulary that you can have with no plan approval, but there are certain drugs then on that formulary that require plan approval. Harris Methodist did that on January 1st. I took over February 1st. I'm trying again in February. Okay. The only words she understood out of all that were the months of January and February, right? But I am. Not on the computer. Specific <clears throat> care will not pay. Because it is part of the closed formulary that Harris Methodist put in place on January 1st. Okay. Talk to me about his tone of voice and his demeanor. Terrible. Terrible, right. Okay. How else? Dismissive condescending, right? Patronizing, right? Terrible. Now tell me about the lady in the audience. You don't see her, but you can tell me what her state of mind is. I would say she's agitated, frustrated, and very angry, right? Now eventually this encounter is going to break up. All encounters come to an end. What's the woman in the audience going to do? Change plans, possibly if she can, but she's guaranteed to do what? Tell all her neighbors and her friends, of course. Now, think of this. This goes, takes us right to the question of preparation, because most of us are where I was 30 years ago. What do I want to say? What do I think somebody needs to know, which I, in my wisdom, will share with them? Okay? Where what you want to say is, what makes them hear certain things? What makes them believe certain things? What makes them remember certain things? And most of all, who are they going to go tell about it? Okay, this is the turret that the, the trick I want to teach you because this is one that all of us in this movement need to know. Okay, let's redo this and see if we can affect what the woman passes on. Okay, 
very specific techniques. She is angry, she thinks his company caused the problem, and the first words she wants to hear out of his mouth are, I'm sorry, right? We call that an acknowledgement. That becomes your control, but very, very short, okay? I'm sorry. Now the next thing she'd like him to say, she's hoping he'll say is, you're, well, yeah, C can he say that? Can he offer to say, I'll fix it? Mm, no, I couldn't. He could say what though? I'll look into it. Now, which is stronger? I'll look into it or I promise I'll look into it? Yeah. Promise, right? Promise is a big memory driving word. If you look over at the FedEx um, ad bank, their little slogan is the purple promise. Okay, I will make every FedEx experience outstanding. And they use that word very intentionally. Promise is a memory word. Now the other thing you're doing, notice, is you're putting this together in very specific pieces. People tend to think and talk at the same time, which is wonderfully spontaneous, but tends to run everything together. If you want people to hear things, the more segmented your speech is, the better it's going to work out. So let's keep going. I'm sorry. I promise we'll look into it. Okay. It's an evening meeting, so somebody will call you tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Here's the real one. Okay. The role that we assign ourselves tends to has a, a huge impact on how we communicate. He's talking at her. If he becomes the questioner, that if he turns this into an interactive exchange, it's going to turn out quite differently. And the technique is called framing a question to obtain assent. That is framing a question so that you've got the best possible chance that the person's actually going to say yes. Okay, so the way this should go is, I'm sorry, build it with me. I promise we'll look into it. Someone will call you tomorrow. Would that be all right with you? She's almost certainly going to say what? Yes. I even got a smile over here, right? I like you, right? You're okay. fantastic. Okay. okay. Now when she goes and talks to people, which she is going to do, what's she going to say and what word do I want her to pick up and repeat? I want her to say, they made me a promise. As long as we call her the next day, will we know anything the next day, incidentally? No. Nah. But as long as we call her the next day, we've kept our promise. In other words, we have changed the dynamics of this by understanding several things. When we pick up and repeat each other's words, we can influence that. We got a good sense of the word we think she'll pick up. We've taken charge of the dynamics of this and we've made it interactive. Now, of course, this is my all-time favorite example. I will keep it forever and I'm the mother load of these things, okay? Because the ad promised us what? Honesty and what kind of answers? Straightforward answers, what's he done to it? Everybody gets it, but it's how I make my living. Okay? The stuff over on the formal side of the network, everybody's done a good job with that because they're thinking about it. It's on the other side of it, this power of person-to-person -person communication that always gets screwed up, and yet that's where the real power is. Okay? Whereas all he had to do was do what we said, and it would have turned out much differently. Incidentally, we have this because a group of uh, physicians got caught up in the same town hall meetings. They had the good sense to come in and get and practice. So we're there videotaping them to critique them. And this guy just falls into our lap as a gift from God. Okay. All right, while I've got you, uh, <clears throat> so words are critical and they're most important. And we don't have clarity or definition of what these key words are. We've got a whole bunch of words. We're all over the map with these things. And we have a ton of jargon, which is screwing it up. Now, I realize that with as many interests involved in this as there are, it's difficult to come up with this, but as a concept, it is worth struggling with. What are we advocating? Because I think as I've looked at the literature and listened to you, I mean, I think we can arrive at a list of anchor words. Uh, and you've heard my feelings about jargon, okay? <clears throat> if it's a word, a phrase, an acronym, if your listener doesn't use it on a daily basis, don't use it! Okay. Um, Numbers. We got a lot of numbers. Boy, they're causing trouble. They don't mean anything. <clears throat> we found a blood alcohol level in Nancy Benoit of 0 0.184 grams per 100 milliliters, or a 0.184, as many people would commonly know. All clear? All right. Okay, here's the rule, guys. If we have numbers, <clears throat> and we do have numbers, 
Uh, we got to pick out the ones that are central to the anchor argument, and then we have to make them what we call verbally visual. That is, if there's a number that's a key part of the narrative, and you do have some, here's a good example. <laughs> well, you know, I for one cannot wait to drive this F-150. I want to feel. Yeah, I want to get the sense of what a truck that's 700 pounds lighter feels like. I was I was talking to a colleague the other day, and he said, you know, that's sort of that's like taking my Harley out of the back of the truck. You know, that's wow. roughly the weight of a that. Harley. I love that example. I have no clue what a truck chassis weighs, but the visual image of picking up the motorcycle and taking it out now, I can picture it. Uh, The next thing we want to talk about um, are what we call targeted messaging. <clears throat> Here's another FedEx example. So you are doing this out of the goodness of your heart. Okay, snarky question. Okay, but Doug knows exactly what he's doing. He's the CEO of FedEx Freight. Well, we think it's the right thing to do. Okay, that's what we call the aspirational headline. You put that out right away. Okay, who's he talking to? But we also think that by helping some of our customers in this sector of their business where they have so much trouble budgeting and controlling costs. Okay. Notice he's defined who he's talking to and he's characterized them so we know, we want them to know that we understand what they're struggling with. And it's an interesting technique when you're speaking because I think you all know people only listen to what affects them. And so they may be sitting there and looking at you, they're not picking up any of it until you ask any of you who've seen a sharp spike in your electric rates, or any of you who are concerned about the kind of life your children or grandchildren have, what you want is people to think, oh, he's talking directly to me, and then they listen up. <clears throat> I probably should deal with one more memory driver because it's important and it affects us, <clears throat> um, and that's forward-looking words like promise, prediction, and guarantee, because we tend to get peppered with Questions, can you guarantee this, blah, 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 blah. Um, and there's a trick to doing this, but it also goes into delivery. I'm okay on time, aren't I? Okay. Okay. He looked at his watch. Okay. No, no, I've gotten, I've got, I, I've, I've, heard, I've heard my, uh, my ground rules. Okay. Um, the trick with the, these words, again, uh, guarantee, prediction, and promise, they're the, the, the big words are to repeat them but attach them to what you want them to attach to. So let's see if I can find a good example. Okay, put your... coaching hats on. Here's the White House doing it wrong. Ms. <clears throat> Brown, are you guaranteeing that it will be capped by August? There are no guarantees here, as you all said. Okay. And of course what she should have said, you know, I wish I could. Let me tell you what I can guarantee that we are working very hard on it, right? So you pick up the word, you take it out of the context of the of the question and you put it into the context of what you're going to say. Now, uh what that means though, uh we got some major problems on our side of the uh, equation. Um here's somebody who I think has been taught the technique but not the delivery, and it also tells you more about the environment that we're operating in. <clears throat> Unless the demand. What guarantees are you going to give this liberal about how that will reduce the cost of, uh, of uh, gasoline <clears throat> at the pump if we let you drill where you say you want to drill? I can guarantee to the American people, because of the inaction of the United States Congress, ever increasing prices. Okay. Um, what's the matter with that? <laughs> Very combative. Boom, 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 boom. Why is he behaving like that? Somebody said it over here. Because she is, that's right. She's mirroring back his behavior. So notice he's, and I would say I'm not even sure the message is correct. He does have the guarantee word trade technique, although I think using it to blame Congress is probably not how I would have structured it. But the other thing it tells you is that, this, I mean, you again, it's like the Mary Barra example from General Motors. You'd think big companies understand this. It drives me nuts. But that also tells me that there is apparently nobody at Shell who is either competent or probably empowered to say to them, let's practice. Because the people are going to be watching. Who should the audience be? 
That's right, everybody watching TV. And also, while you've got it, look at the facial expression of the guy with him. Okay. Everything about it, I hate you. I don't want to be here. I don't like you. Okay. Why, after Ronald Reagan's presidency, this is so hard to understand is utterly beyond me. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to take a quick pass <clears throat> Excuse me, at this concept that we took a, look, a little look at with the guy from Pacific Air of acknowledging the question. Okay? And there's a big difference in, how, in nomenclature. If you think your job is to answer the question, then you accept the parameters, the topic, and the words. If you think your job is to respond, you get a lot more flexibility. And this concept that you start by acknowledging that you've heard the question is what we pioneered actually before I went to the White House at the Federal Trade Commission. Some of you may know Jim Miller, who was the, uh, the economist who was uh, my boss, the chairman. And um, Jim brought with him from OMB President Reagan's deregulatory initiative, or at least part of it, including the Speakers Bureau, which devolved to me. So uh, what do you do when you run a career agency with 1,100 lawyers and um, economists? Um, and you have to incentivize them to want to get out and talk. And of course, the first thing they did was, think, I have a whole hour to go to the Omaha Chamber of Commerce and talk about Hart Scott Rodino. I said, well, maybe not, you know, <clears throat> maybe like five minutes, you know. But I had to teach them how to handle, respond to questions. And the uh, prevailing teaching at that time, which is still around today, is called bridging. You listen to the question and you build a bridge over to where you're going. Well, it became instantly apparent that my principals, who were lawyers and economists, had no idea how to bridge. They never got across the bridge. So we had to come up with something else. And we stumbled into this concept that if you just acknowledge hearing the question, you can go anywhere you want. It's Again, it goes to this concept of how you manage hearing. Absolutely fascinating. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. This is the first example I got my hands on to illustrate it, so it also illustrates the power of examples. Let me go through some true or false with Okay, so it says answer true or false. Can you clear up some misconceptions about, about <clears throat> what the defense does or doesn't want? Um, that to qualify for this jury, the defense would like the person to know little or nothing about the case. Um, I, I think that that's uh, virtually an, an impossibility. That the defense is best off with lower income blue collar types than higher income white collar types. Not necessarily. That the defense is better off with men and minorities than they are with women and whites. Not necessarily. That the defense would much prefer younger jurors to older ones. Again, not necessarily. Okay, so he says answer true or false. She doesn't answer one. <laughs> true or false. Has she been rude? No. no. Okay. Who gets to pick the, the phrase that you use to indicate that you've heard the question? You do. Right. Fascinating. Okay, coaching hats on. Back to work. Love congressional hearings. Oh, God, such a rich source of information. Okay, uh, this is the guy from the FDA. The issue is food and substances uh, like toothpaste exported from China contaminated with melamine. Okay. Neither you tell me with any degree of certainty that this product has not entered into the human food supply chain. Um, let me respond to that at first. Yes or no? Okay, so he demands a yes or no answer. I want you to look at this guy's body language Tell me if you think he believes what he's saying. Yes. Why not? Closes his eyes, looks away. It's the gulp. I like the gulp. Okay. Um, in the handouts in front of you, you'll see there are a bunch of acknowledgement phrases. See if you can come up with one because he must find a substitute. To the human food supply chain. Um, let me respond to that at first. Yes or no? Okay. Pick out one you like. Come on, you ought to be able to come up with a couple on the air. It's not, it's not that simple, would do just fine and would be better than. Oops. Neither you tell me with any degree of certainty that this product has not entered into the human food supply chain. Um, let me respond to that at first. Yes or no? 
And it's not that simple would do very well. I'd be better than this. Yes. But that answer is not valid. And we are in big trouble. Um, you can be incredibly aggressive at this. It's really fascinating. This is Karen Katz, the CEO of Neiman's. She's a client. And they are expanding into Neiman, into uh, China. Was it a challenge dealing with the Chinese government to get this deal to happen? Perfectly reasonable question, the one we actually expected, not one we want to answer ever. Why? That's, and who's watching this? The Chinese government, right. Okay. This is a rehearsed, practiced technique. Well, I, I have to say, well, just to back up a little bit. We okay. Do we ever get back to the Chinese government? No. <laughs> Once we've gotten into Louis Vuitton, Guangdong province, the Chinese government's long gone. All right. Um, this is the most important tool, but I'm just going to sort of ding it for you. Again, there's some um, phrases on your thing. I also bought a couple of cards if anybody wants one for their wallet. <clears throat> and But this is, the, this is your control technique because it lets you go where you're going to go. It also solves the problem. <clears throat> that <clears throat> if you look like you're ignoring the question, people listen differently. This is one of President Clinton's lawyers, and this group will remember him and may remember this. That should be used. Let me ask you this question. The White House as yet has not questioned any of the facts in the Star Report. Do you now admit that the President has committed perjury? Okay. The simplest of framing questions, do you admit the president has committed perjury? This is President Clinton's own lawyer, we expect, an emphatic. Absolutely not. You know, the first thing that we should do in this process, Bob, is the question of the standard. And everybody jumps to what conclusion? Yes, of course. I normally stop this here because it goes on for almost 90 seconds. At the end of it, he finally says, no, it's too late. This is about managing the hearing process. All right, so I've touched on the concept of acknowledgments. Now I want to go back <clears throat> to how we compete <clears throat> with facts and numbers. And what we do, we look at the Pacific Care one. <clears throat> uh, for years I've criticized Hewlett Packard because their printers and their ads were so horrible. Okay. Um, but about two years ago, they had a major change of heart, and now the ads all look like this. Ralph, he's what you call a runner, <laughs> and he can be one tough and blind to find, but he can't outrun HP Innovation. Okay, we are 10 seconds into this, and you know everything. Okay, first of all, what's the word they're pushing through? Innovation. Okay, what are they not telling us anything about? The printer, right? And you know why? Because they know you don't care okay, how many pages it faxes, prints, scans, transmits, or whatever else it does. Okay. Instead, they're going to tell us a story. Okay? It's a story about an animal. What kind? An iguana. What's his name? Ralph. Ralph. Okay. What's his situation? He's lost. lost. Okay. Spoiler alert, in 60 seconds, guess what? They find Ralph, right? Bingo. Okay. And I love this. Ten seconds, you got all that. Okay. And that's because it finally dawned on Hewlett Packard that people don't care about facts and statistics. Now, I say that getting ready to dodge the uh, Rotten Tomatoes because our whole movement is built on what? Facts and statistics, right? Okay. Major problem. Okay. <clears throat> so we got to find stories. <clears throat> Um, you'll notice in our material we call these anecdotes, and that's actually back to Jim Miller at the Federal Trade Commission. <clears throat> Where's Clint? Right okay. Oh, perfect, good, thank you. <clears throat> the, um, uh, Jim's most withering criticism was to say that's just anecdotal evidence. And my response was, and what other kind is there. And as far as I can tell from where I sit, the problem is, is that the other side has got all the good anecdotes, and we don't. Okay? And we're just talking about free markets. One, I don't know, do any of you know Jim? I'm sh 
Dr. Miller? Okay. The, um, uh, one day at a, at a commission meeting, he got so frustrated, he actually went and dragged in a flip chart and started drawing supply and demand curves. And, you, and I sat there, I'm in charge of the media, so I'm looking there, looking like, I don't think they had ever seen a supply and demand curve. I had no clue what it was. <clears throat> anyway, and then <clears throat> I had a revelation. Uh, Dr. Miller liked to talk about rents, a term that's probably familiar to, to you guys, but to all the media I dealt with, everybody else, they thought, isn't that what you pay for your apartment? I'm trying to figure out how can I wrap up as quickly as possible. Um, let me finish with this anecdote and, and then I'll get off the stage. But into my lap fell the hair braider. And there are now a bunch of hair braiders, but she was the first one. And the story goes like this. A young woman here in Washington, D.C., African-American, and she learned to braid hair about the age of eight or nine. She got so good at braiding hair that her mom's friends started to pay her. And by the time she was 14 or 15, she had a thriving business. She had a chock full of nuts can full of cash, and they paid their first visit to a depository institution, a credit union. And the girl thought, I could have a business. I could have my own salon. You can see where this is going. In swoops the Washington, D.C. Board of Cosmetology, and they say, you need a license. You need to pay us a 1000 bucks, and you need to go to school and get a cosmetology license. And she said, but you don't teach hair braiding. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up the story. Okay. Um, so anyway, you can see what happened. They shut her down. And everybody understands how regulation impedes competition. But here's the key. When you ask, who do you care about more, the Board of Cosmetology or this 14-year-old? Who do you want to help? And everybody says her, right? Um, so wrapping up my remarks, and we get to be on a panel later this afternoon, right? So I want to take all my props and stories, and I'm moving them over to that. But the key for this is to think where we've been. Instead of, oh, I hate to say this in front of this erudite group, instead of trying to educate people, I, want to, I recommend saying, could I tell you a story? Okay. And they're going to say, yes. And then the story needs to be, promise of things to come stories, right? Okay. The story is how you get people to remember it. Just as you will remember forever our pal the iguana whose name was Ralph, Ralph whose situation was that he was lost. But you already knew that in 60 seconds he would be found. Is that not a metaphor for what we're talking about? Thanks guys, did a great job.